Good evening to all our friends in Israel and good day to our friends in the U.S. and all over the world. My name is Ruby Shanmir and I'm the Executive Director of AFL, America-Israel Friendship League in Israel. Since March, AFL launched Friends Indeed as a campaign to connect Americans and Israelis during these unusual trying times as a virtual community building opportunity. We have hosted webinars twice a week. Among the most successful series of webinars, we have presented Israeli art. We featured the Rubin Museum and the Gutman Museum from Tel Aviv, and we hosted key personalities in Israeli modern art in, in a panel. Today, I'm happy to be your host in a webinar which will focus on Tel Aviv Crafts and Design Biennale 2020, which is displayed right now at the Museum of Eretz Israel, Musa in Tel Aviv. This was the first exhibition I visited after the lockdown in March and April. Just two miles from our home, I was overwhelmed and thought I must share the experience with our friends. Let me quote from the introduction to the, to the exhibition. The Biennale presents a challenging perspective on material creation, expanding and highlighting the, the cultural, social, and visual dialogue between art, craft, and design. In the exhibition, 250 works are featured both indoor and outdoor, by this webinar, you will be able to experience some of the highlights of the exhibition through uh, Yuval Saar, a co-chief curator, and by two of the artists presented in the exhibition, presenting in the exhibition. Yuval is editor-in-chief of and founder of Portfolio Magazine, a Tel Aviv-based independent online art and design magazine, chief curator and founder of the Tel Aviv uh, Illustration Week and former head of the Shenkar Institute of Documentation and Design Research in Israel. For everyone on this uh, call, whether on Zoom or on Facebook, please your, use your chat function to tell us where you are, where you're calling from. I already saw that some of you already did that in the chat. And feel free to send us your questions for the panelists throughout the webcast, and we will try to get to as many as possible. For everyone on Facebook, please turn on watch a party so other friends can join live as well. Yuval, the floor is yours. Uh, thanks, Ruby, for inviting me to speak about the Biennale. Um, I'll show my screen so we can all I see. I call it Biennale from Italy. From yeah. <laughs> um, now that can everybody see, we have plenty of nice images. So uh, thank you for inviting me uh, to speak about this exhibition. Um, and maybe I would start by saying that for me, it's a bit weird talking about this exhibition, which I haven't seen because uh, since early February, I'm on a sabbatical in London, where I am now, and all my plans to get back to the opening were canceled because of the pandemic, but uh, we'll get back to it later on. So in the next uh, 15 minutes or so, uh, before asking two of the artists taking part, as you said, in the banner to join us, um, I would like to take you behind the scenes of the banner, and since we are limited in time, I won't go into details, uh, a focus on the general idea, but don't worry, as I say, we have plenty of images. And I invite all our friends from uh, Las Vegas, Toronto, Florida, uh, Ohio, Netanya, uh, give a time, and all other parts of the world. Uh, and feel, Kuwait, Kuwait. And Kuwait, sure, yeah. Uh, feel free to ask questions in the chat, in the Q&A, or the Facebook page. Uh, and we will do our best to uh, ask uh, to answer all the all the questions. So, uh, about uh, two years ago, I was approached by Dr. Debbie Hirschman, 
She was then a relatively new chief curator at the Eretz Israel Museum in Tel Aviv. We met, and Debbie told me about her vision of artistic renewal for the museum as a unique site, as you can see here with one of the new works at the Biennale. Uh, we can see from the museum all Tel Aviv. Um, a museum and a site dedicated to the presentation of material culture. Over the past two decades, the museum has held a series of biennials, each focused on a different medium, traditionally identified with the history of craft and design, such as ceramics, glass, paper, textile, jewelry. As we proceed into the 21st century, Debbie added, we aim to <clears throat> we aim to embark on a new path. In other words, why hold a separate biennial for each medium? Look at the pictures. After all, we are in the 21st century. In recent years, the field of craft and design operate in shared context, as evidenced both by the engagement with new technologies and by the sources of inspiration, which affect each other and are influenced by one another. In order to fill this vision, we have conceived of the Tel Aviv Biennale of Craft and Design in the spirit of contemporary global artistic tendency to rupture the boundaries between different fields. Five curators were appointed to this ambitious mission. Two chief curators, me included, and three associate curators. A year and a half ago, we published an open call in which we, the curator, asked artists and designers whose work focused in Israel to send a position under the theme on-off. What on-off could mean? It could mean the tension between past and present. It could mean tradition and innovation, uh, art and functionality. And it could range from laborious manual creation to works that make use of advanced technologies, thus linking craft and design to contemporary art. Eventually, we chose 250 works for among the 3,000 proposals submitted to the museum. A year and a half later, the panel presents for the first time in Israel. And actually, we've, we've conducted a search all over the world to see which kind of exhibition and panels we have, probably most of us know the Art Biennale in Venice. There are other art biennials, there are design biennials, but this kind of banner who do crafts and design and art, not so many and not in such a big scale. So the banner, as I said, presents now for the first time in Israel, a large scale exhibition that brings together different manifestations of contemporary craft and design shedding light on the local scene. It maps the scope of this creative sphere, identifies resemblance and differences, and explores new directions. As curators, our interdisciplinary approach blurs the boundaries between disciplines and undermines existing hierarchies. And we'll talk about it in a few minutes with my fellow artist, who will join me shortly, because when we chose the work, we didn't ask them what are they doing if the designers or artists or craftsmen we just focus on the work because the work its point of departure is matter as a form of cultural expression as a physical bit or virtual or even metaphorical presence one of the things we talked about and i'm not sure i have a strict answer maybe you have uh, you could tell me during our talk is the definition of craft and design and the differences and similarities between the two constantly shifting and evolving. Craft and design function like communicating vessels, exchanging roles or even merging together. Whereas craft traditionally, the, well, we like to think about it as a practice based on empirical knowledge, gives rise to unique artifacts, Design is commonly conceived by, to be closely connected to industry and mass production. Both, however, revolve around material knowledge, are strongly linked to science and technology, and are in tune to their environment, and to the social, political, and economical processes 
taking place in operating in shared context, these two fields nourish and respond to one another. Eventually, after choosing the 250 works, not dividing them into craft, design, or art, by 300 artists, as we call them, we divided them into five thematic chapters, first person, second nature, which also gave the banner its name, must need, heaven and earth, you are here, and back to the future. Let's see a little bit about this uh, chapter so we can see what it is. First Person Naked Nature, the banner's title, relates to the creative, individual, unmediated physical, emotional, and mental engagement with different medium and expression. The repetitive actions required to internalize different skills play a central role in the artist's life and are transformed over time into an instinct, a second nature. Think about it, what is your second nature? Um, I get up every morning and I take a shower, brush my teeth. It's like a second nature for me. I do it every day. Maybe uh, while we are drinking coffee, taking the dog out. So this is habit, but it's also habit when we're talking about creation. Um, this repetitive action requires to internalize different skills, uh, as I say. It's a dynamic form. And by means of such actions, the body, the artist's body learn how to speak the language of the material. And sometimes even as artists said, through this action, they understand the world through it. That the concept second nature creates an extension of the maker's body, which participates in the artistic act. The second nature must be urgency and longing underlines the word must and mean. While this term alluded to an inner creative urge, they also refer to consumer culture, and many of the objects in this chapter are presented as the object of desire. I want this motorcycle which all glass blown for trees at my home. I want these figurines. I want it, I need it, I have to have it. And so these two words, must and need, are not polar opposites. Rather, these states of consciousness exist along a, one, a continuum just like gender, identity, and culture. And in a climate of social and political and economic instability, both in Israel and internationally, this work suggests various ways of exploring the meaning of creative endings. So what does it mean to be an artist in 2020 during the pandemic? Do I have to be an artist? Do I even know to do something else? Do I need to do something? The engagement with this concern may be perceived as a reaction against the virtual world, as an ideological act, or an escape from reality, or even as an existential need. The next chapter you are here um, relate to this common expression which notes one location on a specific moment in relation to the territory indicated on the map. The geographical sphere in which the creative process unfolds continues to influence artists' minds, artistic minds, even in an age marked by globalization in which the line between the local and the universal is increasingly blurred. So, this work enables viewers to orient themselves in the space by touching upon local narrative, raising social political concerns, and presenting physical and conceptual material related to the local sphere. And yes, this panda bear was created before the pandemic and before we even think about wearing masks. Heaven and Earth, two opposing forces, share the cha this chapter a terrestrial one and a spiritual one. As they encounter one another, the spiritual and the material forming a single, enigmatic, and mutilated perspective. The selection of works tread the thin line between heavy, earthly realm and one devoid of weight and volume. This world brings together the earthy and the sublime, exposing the moment of transition between extremes, much like an embrace that transforms heaven and earth into a single entity 
encompassing an entire world. The last chapter, Back to the Future, features an assembly of works that build a, metaphor, a metaphorical bridge between future, present, and past. This work carries a memory of creative process, which is supplemented by new layers of interpretation arising from the encounter with progress and innovation. They are concerned with something that has been transformed while still bearing traces of its earlier forms of existence. After dividing the, the world to five chapters, which of course could be transformed between the both, we, we, we were thinking about, okay, now we have the words, where are we putting them in the museum? Because as I mentioned before, over the past two decades, the museum has held a series of banners, medium-based, corresponding to the museum thematic structure as reflected in its structural layout, a series of independent pavilions, each dedicated to a different medium, closely affiliated with local material culture. Expanding for the first time into the museum permanent display, galleries in other sites, the banner creatively explores, responds to, and interact with the museum's collection, architecture, settings, and history. The open invitation for participants to intervene in its permanent displays, like the man and his work center that we see here, the glass pavilion, which we see here, the ceramic pavilion, and the outdoor location, has given, rise, has given rise to contemporary works that imbue these spaces with new energy. The dialogue established between the contemporary works and the historical artifacts open up a space for new readings, connections, and associations as one artistic voice responds to another across the century. As I said before, if you read about COVID-19, because I think it has a meaning in this exhibition. As we embarked on the journey to create the first Tel Aviv banner of crafting design, um, we all knew that we were boldly setting off on a major adventure. We, we, we didn't have a clue what we're gonna go and, and what kind of work we're gonna have and doing this major exhibition all over the museum um, but the outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic, which occurred as the exhibition was being realized, added unique challenges to the plot. I think the next biennial in the post-COVID-19 area will likely reflect the pandemic impact. However, at the same time, this current exhibition echoes contemporary concerns with global issues, dealing with a relationship with the Earth, the desire for endless consumption, and other seemingly prophetic themes that herald what is yet to come. The opening of the banner was scheduled for March 2020, during which, as in many parts of the world, as you probably have been uh, saw, a lockdown was imposed in Israel. By exerting tremendous effort, we managed to complete the mountain of this exhibition just prior to the closure of all cultural institutions. During the three months of lockdown, we were eager to show the world what we have accomplished. Four months ago, the banner was open to the public, but it will be open until May 2021. So assuming air travel will be safe, all of you, the other matter from where, Florida, uh, Mexico, all over the world, you have plenty of time to plan your next visit to Tel Aviv. I'm sure you won't be disappointed. At this point, I would like to welcome two of the artists taking part in the banner. Yonin Paranga and Dov Grancho. If you travel around the world for the last years, you could have popped into the works in the most important museum and galleries around the world, such as the Jewish Museum, the Cooper Unit in New York, Pompidou Center in Paris, Banks in Disneyland in UK, and so on. And since we talked about breaking the boundaries and hierarchies, I won't introduce them yet. I won't tell you what their practice is and how they define themselves. I let them speak about the work first and then we'll get into it. So first of all, let's talk with Ronit, whose works the cake is this one. Hi Ronit, how are you? Hi, great. 
Well, uh, I'll, you... talk about, I'll talk about my work, the cake. Um, yes. This is an installation that exhib exhibited in uh, the Biennale Museum. Uh, the idea is an intimate interaction between figures, savage figures, that bending on the ground and kneeling, observing a cream cake that instead of strawberries have mouses. The relationship between the figures and the cake is redefined because the cake that represents hedonism and uh, unlimited pleasure does not allow us to eat it anymore. So who eats who in the new order? Who makes the rules and what are the rules? And what is it made of, you haven't said? Excuse me? What is it made of? Oh, uh, it's made of clay, acrylic paint, um, molding paste, uh, bones, hair, and lack varnish. And how, and how long does it take you to do this kind of work? Well, I'm doing simultaneously in my studio several works, but this specific one, it takes years. <laughs> yes. Years. <laughs> yeah, so as you can see, this is how it's uh, shown in the museum. And it's real size, it's like actual size of a uh, young adult. Uh, yes. Yes, eating a cake or the cake eating them. I uh, will get back to you shortly after we'll uh, speak to Dov and see what he made for the exhibition. And then we'll talk about arts, craft, design, and who cares. So Dov, hi, how are you? Hey there. So you uh, So the work? Yeah, the bills of the Anthropophysian. Let's talk about it. Uh, okay, so I, I'm showing uh, this work. This it's basically it's a cow skull. It's a it's part of a series of works, all based on uh, cow skulls. Some are real, some are 3D printed. And maybe before I say a few words about them, I'll, I'll just say that uh, often, and and I sort of consider myself. This is another conversation as to how we define ourselves. But I work out of the design discipline, and sort of the way we work as professionals is usually you go through this thought process, and you you develop a design brief and you work out what it is exactly you want to do and only then do you realize the work. And sometimes in my sort of more personal work, it starts with actually just doing something and then stepping back, looking at it and, and trying to realize uh, what's happened in front of me and then uh, deciding on a progression from there. So, so it's, a, it's a lot more back and forth. And so this is one of those projects that was simply triggered by the fact that I had skulls laying around my home. <laughs> which sounds kind of funny. I, I have skulls lying around my home or rather in my backyard because I really like being outdoors and I trek and I hike and every once in a while uh, there's something that winds up coming home with me and, uh, and a cow skull was one of those things. Uh, yeah, uh, this one is uh, in the Naofu Valley. That's not a cow. It's very close to the Tibetan border. That's something that stayed where it was. Uh, <laughs> um, but anyway, so, uh, so a lot of times I, I find myself sort of living with these objects and sometimes it, it triggers something uh, that makes me want to start working with that object. And I'm, one of the things I'm really interested in is sort of trying to understand fundamentals of making things and sort of universal kind of understandings that you, you really see often when you wind up in, in places like Tajikistan and Morocco and Alaska, and you start realizing that there are certain things that you can uh, identify as consistent patterns in human behavior or in the way humans manipulate material. And so there's this theme that I like working out of, which is basically uh, the way we've uh, sort of impressed our, um, our interests and our uh, wants on nature, the way we've manipulated ma nature is why the name of the project is Beast of the Anthropocene, because uh, a cow, as far as I'm concerned, is a manufactured product. And if you, we look at art history and we start thinking about uh, the definition of what ready-made is and how, what, what would fall under a definition of ready-made, the manufactured issue becomes, becomes a real issue. And again, uh, working out of industrial design discipline, 
there's sort of this understanding of the way we manipulate things. So a, a cow today is basically uh, bred so that either it's going to uh, give us milk products or it's going to give us meat or it's going to give us leather. And it's been bred over many, many years. Uh, it, they're no longer wild beasts as they may have been uh, 5,000 or 10,000 years ago. And so this sort of idea of working with a ready-made skull um, in a way that uh, emphasizes and shows our imposition, the imposition of ourselves onto the object was key in sort of working out the, these objects. Now, all that said, I just yes. want to add that, that, uh, that objects, as far as I'm concerned, have to first speak for themselves and sort of work as compositions, as sculptures, as whatever. And, you know, if I, if I have something to say to back it up, then, then that's wonderful. But, you know, the object sort of, as far as I'm concerned, has to first speak for itself. So let's walk us through a little bit about the process. What do we see here? So this, for instance, is a, is a 3D printed cow skull. So this was a skull that I uh, uh, carried with me to the Hebrew University, to uh, the uh, Institute of Archaeology. They have a digital lab there where they scan artifacts and they were uh, friendly enough and nice enough to uh, scan the cow skull for me. So I had a scan of a cow skull. And then I uh, created a collaboration with Stratasys, which is a 3D printing technologies uh, manufacturer and developer, uh, both in, in the United States and in Israel and globally. And, uh, and they did all the printing. And so what we have here is basically a cow skull that's been sectioned into three with this sort of dovetail connector so that I can integrate and change uh, different parts. So for instance, here, the back of the head, the, the area where the horns uh, would have been in the previous one has been replaced with handlebars, which is of course sort of a art history reference to Picasso's uh, uh, bull bull spell, which I'm sure most of you are familiar with. Um, uh, or this one, for instance, which has had both the front and rear areas of the skull uh, replaced with cubical masses. And, and the cube sort of, or the square represents, I think, often in the way I see it, human thinking and the way we sort of lay out grids on the ground. And, you know, you, it's very obvious when you uh, walk around Google Earth and, and see the way uh, we've arranged our surroundings. So here it's basically rearranging this cow skull and it has a black chrome finish to it, which, which gives us this sort of spacey, uh, otherworldly sort of feel. Yeah, it looks like uh, out of space. And just so we understand, I'm getting back to your work at the Biennale. What we see here is, is 3D printed, it's real, it's, it's leather. What do we see here? I'm, I'm kind of glad you asked. I, you know, even though we only have one uh, in, in the sh current show, uh, I, one of the things that was interesting to me to sort of ask was what the, the way people relate to an object if they know it, that object used to be alive or not. So this one specifically is indeed a real cow skull, but it's, uh, it's been impregnated with uh, polyester and with uh, resins so that so it's basically fossilized and, and the uh, bone material itself isn't in its original color. But, it, but it's really a curious question of how, how we relate to something if, uh, if suddenly it's revealed to us that it's the real thing or not and, and what's real anyways. And so, um, this, so this cow skull has um, wet molded leather sheaths basically that are uh, that sheath the horns of the cow. The uh, sheaths are made out of, out of uh, cow leather, of course. And uh, it was an opportunity for me to learn how to work with leather, for instance. It was the first time I've actually worked with uh, wet molding and uh, learning how to do saddle stitching. And uh, I had help from, uh, from a dear person who, does, who make, makes shoes, designs shoes, who gave me a lot of tips. And there's always YouTube. Yeah. So, you know, uh, before getting back to Ronit and to you about um, other works that you're doing and maybe to understand a little bit your approach, um, we have a question from the audience um, for us, for the creators. Uh, how do we choose 250 works out of 3,000? What is the selection process? So, of course, the selection process is about a few months uh, going through all the works and trying to understand uh, the point of material and matter, and of course the thematic um, view, is it on off, is it first person, second nature? It, it has to be eventually one exhibition. Um, and I'm sure that if five different creators 
were having the same 3,000 proposals, they would have done, uh, I'm, I wouldn't say a completely different ex exhibition, um, but I'm sure they would do something different, even though one of the things that this day is very important is the image. And if I can answer to this question, when we get to see this image, like we see now this cow uh, with his leather horns, it's interesting. I'm intriguing to know what it is. And when I'm seeing this kind of cake as a proposal of, uh, of, um, of the figure that Renit's doing, I'm also intrigued. Although in the case of the two of you, um, we also know, of course, your work, and we know uh, the, the field that you're uh, working in. But this is another question, and maybe we start with Ronit. Let's get to uh, Ronit, to previous work of yours, but maybe first say, um, can you say a little bit, where do you live, where your studio is, what did you study? Let's say a few words so the audience would get to know you, Ronit. Okay. Um, I'm Ronit Baranga. I live in Zichron Yaakov, my studio is in Zichron uh, Yaakov too. Which um, in Israel I, is in? Excuse me? In Israel, it's in the north part. Uh, oh, the yeah, it's, <laughs> in, it's <clears throat> in the north of the center of Israel. Yes, yes. Not so far uh, from Tel Aviv. Uh, yes. Well, and uh, I... Yeah, about my studies, uh, I have BA in uh, psychology and literature uh, and started to uh, uh, art history for second degree, but then I switched and learned in art school and I decided to be a professional artist. Uh, and from then I work and exhibit, exhibiting. Uh, I have galleries uh, aboard. And, um, and your studio is at your home? How big it is? Too small. It's no matter how big it is, it's too small. <laughs> yeah, so, so let's, let's go a little bit through your works and then we'll try to understand your approach to material, to art, to design, to craft, to these questions um, as a as, as an artist, and I'm saying, and I'm saying artist who takes part in the craft and design by now. Yes, well, I, I'm an artist. I didn't uh, learn design uh, at all, uh, but uh, I choose to show you at the presentation uh, works that uh, deal with, um, with uh, design as I see it. Uh, well, if you can uh, return to the slide before. Yes, uh, this is an inst another installation of mine. I called it Untitled Fist. Uh, it was exhibited in Banksy's Disneyland in 2015. And, and I was exhibiting um, along with Damien Hurst, as you can see, uh, Banksy himself and other great sculptures in a small a circus tent. Uh, my work was uh, at the middle on a table. And yes, and it was 40 pieces of uh, vessels, like kettles and uh, milk kettle and, and sh sugar sauce caps and plates, a tea set vessels. I choose the tea set uh, vessel by purpose because in a tea set, each uh, individual uh, member has a specific role. Uh, like the cattle have a, a role very different from the, uh, from the sugar uh, source. And that, uh, yeah. like, yes. And what, what I did is, no, please go, go in. Uh, I put fingers and mouses to the plates. Uh, I give the plates, the kettles and the cups, uh, the organs in which we use them. And they are organs that fill the environment. And because uh, the cup now has fingers, he can fill the environment and he can react to it. 
and he become an active object. So he will decide if it will let me use it, if it will use itself, if it will run away, it's his decision. And that's really the border between uh, design and art. Uh, now, I, at Disneyland, I, I organize all the pieces with an interaction. Uh, they were leaning to each other. They were running away from another, one to another. And they were in a relationship between them. Uh, if you can move forward, yes. Uh, this piece I did after uh, Banksy uh, because I thought there, if the interaction was physical, if the kettle was squeezing a kettle milk, how would the flesh, how would the chine of flesh would react? So I started a series of works uh, which uh, I call them embrace. It's be between hugging and choking someone. <laughs> and they, they were dealing with the, the pleasure, between the pleasure and the violence. This specific one uh, was exhibited in uh, the Akron uh, Museum of Art in Ohio. And if we continue, okay. Uh, this, uh, this piece is from a solo exhibition in, in a Baynard Gallery in Melbourne, uh, Australia. Uh, I, uh, this is another step in the evolution of the vessels. Uh, they become like creatures, wild creatures, and I sculpt uh, like uh, um, caterpillars, like spiders, like uh, creatures that you can't control. And the girl is holding a caterpillar made of cups and she's screaming at it. And believe me, it screamed back. Yeah, and, it looks like. And, and the interaction is a metaphor for the transformation from childhood to adult. Mm. All right, so I want to, I, I see, I'll show another three of your works and ask you a question so you can relate both to your works and uh, to my question. Uh, well, it, it's not only mine, it's also a question for the audience. Uh, and also dog, think about it now so you can um, reply later. Is your work Israeli in some way? Is it global? Do you want it to be international? Do you care? Can I see that it's got, that it was made in Zichon Yaakov or it could be made anywhere else? Um, because it looks very international and it's fine. I'm not saying it has to be Israeli because as I said previously, when we um, publish the open call, uh, we ask for artists and designers and craftsmen that the work is focused in Israel, but we didn't ask for Israeli works. Well, I, I don't define myself uh, doing an Israeli art. I'm doing art that in, in creed, intrigued me, that, that, that fascinated me, things that I'm feeling, things that I'm uh, thinking about. Um, I live in Israel, so I believe that the pressure uh, of living here uh, must come out in my, in my sculpture. But I have to say that people all over the world connect to it. So I think it's a yeah. human art. <laughs> I don't know, not Israeli, especially. The, a, a, everyone can, can uh, see and feel whether they like it or whether they dislike it, but they... Uh, they react to it, so it's fine by me. Mm. And your choice, and your choice of music. material. I ask, and your choice well, of material. Yes. yes, well, I I always painted, always, all my life. Uh, I uh, went to a high, uh, to a, a professional art school only after. Uh, well, I was married, I was a mother, and I, it was the, the dream of my life to be there. 
And I started with drawing. Only on the second year, I accidentally went into the ceramics department and started to uh, touch clay, I guess, for the first time. And I was in love with the material and I was in love at the option of creating something with my hands and with no tools that... Uh, um, yeah. Between me and my and, and the creation, and uh, I become addicted, really addicted to clay. Mm -hmm. And I have to say that for ten years I didn't draw; I just sculpt in clay. But uh, in the uh, now nowadays I'm drawing, like you see here, I'm drawing over my sculpture. Uh, I'm drawing with acrylic paint uh, over it. All right, so we'll get back to this work later. I, I want to uh, go and uh, speak to, to ask Dov a few questions, but uh, you, you know, it's interesting. You can see the audience uh, a reaction. Some say it looks like a nightmare. Some say, wow, so sweet. So I think you're doing the right job if you get like this sort of uh, all kind of reaction. But it's we'll always like, like that. People, yeah, it's always I, I love it or hate it, and it's yes. okay. Although they, yeah. if they are reacting, it's great. <laughs> all right, so let's get back to Dov. Um, can you say a few words first of all? Um, where do you live? Where your studies? What do you study? Like I will understand you're a designer, but what kind of work do you do? Okay, um, I live on a. a small mountain west of Jerusalem, between Jerusalem and Tel Aviv, two cities that I'm uh, connected with. So I wound, wind up spending a lot of my days in both. So it's a, it's a nice commute and uh, I have great mountains here and forests to run in. I studied industrial design and I work as a professional designer and split my time roughly half and half between teaching in the industrial design department at Bezalel, the Academy of Arts and Design in Jerusalem, and uh, running my own studio out of Jaffa in South Tel Aviv. And uh, if I look at the, at the kind of work I do out of the studio, it, it's really, uh, it sits on a very wide spectrum of different kinds of projects over the years. Uh, usually I'll, I'll sort of try and draw a line between on the one hand, I work with medical companies. There's a lot of uh, R&D in Israel in the medical field. So it could be designing tools for uh, vascular surgery or for a uh, heart bypass operation or orthopedics. And on the very far other end of that, uh, that line that I've drawn uh, are sort of projects like the ones you're seeing here, which are projects that uh, there's no client, there's no brief, and it's just uh, things that I want to do. Um, many of these projects, the, the one in front of you too, were done with uh, professor, the late Professor Ami Drach, uh, who uh, we worked together for 16 years. So some of these works are uh, collaborative with him. Uh, so what I, work, do we I work with the, on, on, I work on consumer products. I design exhibits for museums, etc., uh, etc. Et what you're looking at here is a series of uh, napped, which is the, the term used for a controlled breakage of a flint. It's napped stone tools that have been scanned and have had uh, 3D printed handles added onto them. Uh, again, it's, it's sort of the, the two temporal uh, technologies, I'd say, that, that we sort of 3D printing is sort of the buzzword uh, uh, for the past few years in the manufacturing, and we started to call it now additive manufacturing, and making it stone tools is basically uh, what we've been doing for roughly 2.3, 2.4 million years. Uh, these are parts, these are works from the same series that are that have the uh, handle area dipped in a uh, uh, Rubber, rubbery material and elastomer, which sort of, it, it both increases friction so that you can hold it better and, uh, and it absorbs impact. It does sort of also a branding for the object. And, and again, I'm sort of both really interested in the way things are made. And okay, we're switching from yellow to yellow. Uh, this is a, another ready-made, by the way. This is, this is a, a pre-existing uh, hammer that I bought. 
and using a technique called electro erosion, which is a little known but a quite popular technique of eroding steel. It's used mostly in the mold making industry for plastic products. Basically, you take a piece of copper, which I literally hand filed into the shape of a, a negative shape of a heart, or rather a hole shaped like a heart. And then with an electrical current, you slowly descend on a piece of steel and the elect electrical field breaks apart the atoms so that there's never actually contact between the workpiece and, and the tool, but uh, the atoms sort of break away and you slowly sort of like sticking your hand in the sand uh, can create a form. And this was done for an exhibit in the Periscope Gallery in Tel Aviv, which uh, I think for their 20th anniversary, it's a gallery that is sort of on the forefront of showing uh, design and craft for many years. And it, it was sort of this uh, thought about leaving a mark. And, you know, after having worked for more than two decades in the field, this idea of making an object to, to try and discuss leaving a mark and the hammer being an object that on the one hand we use when we create things, we're building a home with a hammer. On the other hand, there's something very violent about the hammer. It appears every once in a while in horror films uh, because the action is an action that, that sort of uh, uses violent force to change the world around us. So as, as, I'm, as I'm showing uh, a few more of your works, um, I, I wanted to get back to my previous question. Uh, is this work in any part Israeli? Um, do you think they have to be? Um, do you see your work? If you were living in another place in the world, they would have been different. Of course, maybe we start with this one, hummus with the camel and uh, I don't know, olive oil. Yeah, um, yeah, okay. So this one is definitely is, is, a, uh, is a discussion about a, a local context or Middle Eastern context. It's a project I did together with Liora Wuzin, uh, who by chance is also one of the uh, curators uh, at the Biennale we're discussing. And it was done for an exhibit on the subject of hummus, which is maybe also worth pointing out that one of the formats that often is used in the design world is for a curator or a gallery to put, oh, to put out an open call of, on a subject and say, okay, the subject is hummus. What do you have to say about hummus? Which is sort of a different way of creating an exhibit than the traditional uh, art uh, curation where uh, the, the curator will have a concept and then uh, go out and find the works that uh, support that concept. And uh, maybe this is a point where I can, I, I can quote uh, Paola Antonelli on this in, in that, uh, uh, in France, when there's a burning issue, um, the, the, the media goes and asks a philosopher, you know, what, what they have to say about a burning issue. And in Italy, she says, when there's a burning issue, they go and ask architects or designers, you know, what they have to say about a burning issue. So hummus in this case was a burning issue. Yeah. So is it real hummus? What, what is it made of? It is real hummus. Uh, it's uh, hummus uh, or in English hummus. Uh, or chickpea paste for those of you who uh, are uninitiated. Uh, the clouds are rather the mountains. The, the mountains are made out of eggplant. Uh, uh, the lower part is beans. There's an egg there as a sun, olive oil, and the camels themselves are schug or spicy sauce. Yeah. And uh, it, it both is a you know, sort of a discussion about souvenirs and locality, because we all know these sort of uh, glass bottles with colored sand you can get. Uh, and, and also, the, it's called The Original. The name of the project is The Original, and, and, um, and it's a really burning issue, not that we don't have other burning issues, uh, <laughs> hummus on uh, who owns it, who, who owns a recipe, who owns uh, uh, the idea, who owns, and if, if you've been following the, it's for many years now, uh, both legal battles and things like the Guinness Book of World Records between uh, Abu Ghosh, for instance, trying to get the biggest plate of hummus into the uh, uh, Guinness Book of World Records are Lebanon, and so you know it's it's a real, uh, really charged cultural issue here. Yeah. yeah, there are people from the audience who like who, who say that they would buy it as it is. So uh, maybe I don't know, suggest it to one of your clients. Maybe a few words about uh, this uh, work of yours because it's it's I don't know, it looks a bit different from the other ones that we've seen. Uh, it, it's easy for me to draw parallels in, in the sense that these are also ready-mades. They're existing ceramic uh, artifacts that were bought at the flea market in Jaffa and were cut with a diamond saw so that only the central section, the central spine of the teapots or other vessels were left intact. 
And they both become sort of a representation of themselves because they're almost like a, a pictogram. They expose very technical aspects. And again, um, coming from a discipline that, uh, that has a lot to do with planning and executing of planning, the, the, there are issues like how, how a lid meets the, the lip of a teapot, which are actually very interesting for me. And so on the one hand, I see them sort of as being poetic. On the other hand, they sort of uh, have a technical aspect to them, like sort of exposing uh, themselves. And uh, I, I will add just two sentences uh, on your previous question about locality. Um, I, I don't, uh, I wouldn't hashtag myself first as Israeli uh, designer, but a designer often comes with uh, what I do. And I think if you look at exhibits that have been held, even at the Cooper Hewitt or, or in various uh, large venues, 20, 30 years ago, there was an attempt to sort of identify and classify something that we could call Israeli design. You know, 30 years ago, you, you had Japanese design, there was Scandinavian design. It was something you'd look at a car and you'd recognize the maker. And I think that the whole issue of globalization and the internet has created uh, these sort of non-local communities, non-local genres. And so it's much easier for me uh, thinking of, of myself as design from Israel as opposed to Israeli design, where, okay. where you, you wouldn't have to fit yourself into a rigid uh, definition. All right, so Ronit, I want to get back to you and uh, we're going to show uh, a few works. Some of them are new, which haven't been shown yet. And there's a question from the audience, which I think it relates to uh, making new works in this environment. Uh, has COVID-19 affected your work, your thoughts, your creation, your need to do the same thing with something else? And uh, maybe you can answer it by telling us what we see here in these works. Well, uh, it was very difficult period at the beginning. Uh, I was uh, with my family two months at home. We didn't go, come out at all. Uh, and I have to say that uh, during this period, I've done nothing. Mm -hmm. uh, just being with my family. It was a very stressed period of time. But then, uh, the life, life continued. And yeah. I had a lot of uh, deadlines. And these are... Uh, pictures of uh, three exhibitions that are uh, that will open in the next uh, two months, and I had to uh, finish the sculptures and uh, send them away. This is going to be in a uh, Point Gallery in Munich in September, uh, the one before in San Francisco. Yeah, and this one. Uh, this one I, I worked, this is a work towards a solo exhibition, which I would have in October in Australia. And I work on this exhibition along with the cake, the sculpture which I am exhibiting in the Biennale. So the theme is a little bit the same. And Talking about the sweets that uh, that not so our... sweet. It's not so sweet. Like people from the audience are no. also so, like, no. what it's went through your head? Yeah, they're asking what went through your mind. Babies with horns, scary. Please tell. Please share what happened in your world, in your mind, when you're doing this kind of words. Okay. Well. Uh, I wanted to do, um, and well, in which which work do you want to, <laughs> would you like me to talk about? Because there are generally, of course. Generally, well, I really like that my art is uh, like uh, lots of layers simultaneously. So when you see work like that, you think, well, this is intimidate you frighten you but at the same same time it is so sweet and vulnerable so you've got uh, feelings from all over the mm, the polar uh, aspects okay it's, yeah. it's uh, at the same time frighten you and at the same time 
it's, it, it, you like it, it's sweet, it, it's, uh, it's vulnerable. So I, I like the viewer to feel at the same time uh, some, uh, uh, some feelings that uh, don't get along together. Yeah. I, I don't really, I hope that I can say what I think. <laughs> it's much <laughs> easier in Hebrew. But this is, I think this is a line that go uh, in each work of mine. You see things and it makes you um, to feel lots of emotions that you don't uh, really, uh, don't usually feel together. All right. Um, and Dov, uh, has COVID-19 affected your work, your thoughts of making new objects, uh, your studio life? How did you spend the last few months? Uh, well, it, it definitely disrupted plans, but I, I've got to admit that I kind of enjoyed it um, in, in various ways because uh, there was both a chance for me uh, to, to do and learn all the kinds of things that I hadn't had time to do previously anything from uh, learning software to uh, writing peer-reviewed articles, things that, uh, that I don't usually do and don't usually have time to do and sort of use, use that time to, uh, to create di through different venues. And, um, and, and there are venues that remained open, like uh, designing on CAD and having something 3D printed somewhere else, uh, or I had a stock of flint here, so I was able to make a whole lot of hand axes. So I've, I've been really? busy, <laughs> been really busy. Well, this is good, um, and I think we're running out of time. Uh, I could have talked with you, I'm sure, a uh, few more hours, and I'm sure the audience uh, would love to uh, hear us more, but it's about time. So as I said uh, uh, to our audience, you have plenty of time until the end of May to come to the, uh, to, come to the uh, exhibition. I will be in Israel from next month. Uh, thank you, Ronit and Bob, and Ruby, why won't you wrap it up? Thank you, thank you, uh, uh, Ronit, Dov, and, uh, and Yuval. This was fascinating. I've been to the exhibition, as you heard, but uh, having all these explanations make it real, make it different. Thank you very much. Thank you to our audience. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Uh, on behalf of the AISL, I would like to invite you for our next week's webinars. Uh, Sunday will be on wine, and Wednesday will be a, a, a panel discussion on a documentary produced by um, Nancy Spielberg. So I hope you enjoyed it, and uh, see you soon, and see you next week. Thank you.